Bronte Parsonage and also gives us all a chance to get together and have a huge geek out about everything Bronte. Um, we're going to be talking today about how we all respond to the Bronte sisters as artists, creatives, novelists and poets and, and, how, and what they mean to us in the 21st century, but also what the 21st century might mean to them as well. Um, there are seven of us, we are a dream team. So what I'm gonna do is let everybody introduce themselves individually, very briefly before we start talking. Um, I start, I'm Rowan Coleman. I am the author of uh, about 16 novels. Um, and most recently, I've also been writing under the name Bella Ellis. Um, can you spot the Bronte connection? Um, and I've written uh, the Bronte Mysteries. The first in the series is The Vanished Bride, which uh, imagines that before they were renowned authors, the Bronte sisters were also amateur sleuths. It's the UK edition, that's the American edition. Um, so Nikita, I'm gonna throw to you. You have to unmute yourself, Nikita. You are muted. Sorry. I just didn't want like any noise disturbing. Um, my name's Nikita Gill. I am a poet. I have published six collections of poetry. My work predominantly works with myth and uh, fairy tales and folklore. And I basically work with the perspectives of women within those classic myths that we have been constantly told and classic stories that we've constantly been told. I've recently published, well, to be published, my new novel in verse, which is about the Hindu pantheon. And my connection to the Brontes is that I read them growing up. And I think that it's really important that we carry on the feminist tradition of writing as women and giving women their voices back. Agree. Um, Julie Cohen. Hello. Uh, my name's Julie. I um, am a novelist and I, my master's degree is in Victorian literature, but actually all of my novels up till recently have been contemporaries. But my most recent novel, which is called Spirited, is a queer historical Victorian um, novel. And I was inspired um, by the Brontes in their Gothic tradition, their use of the Gothic, and also their um, feminist sensibility. Um, and their feeling of being out of step with the times. Brilliant. And my co-host, Anula Austin. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here. Um, I'm also a novelist. Um, my debut, which is a historical novel, Bronte's Mistress, was just released um, last month by Atria Books. Bronte's Mistress is based on the true story of Lydia Robinson, the older married woman rumored to have had an affair with Branwell Bronte. So Branwell and Anne are major characters in my novel, of course, um, and Charlotte and Emily are very much there in the background too. And Siri James. Hello, my name is Siri James and I'm the author of 13 novels of historical fiction and romance that have been published in 21 languages, probably best known for um, my bestseller, The Lost Memoirs of Jane Austen, and for The Secret Diaries of Charlotte Bronte, which is about Charlotte's journey to become a published author and her tempestuous romance, and I'm proud to say was named a great group read by the Women's National Book Association and won the Audio Book Audio Award for Romance. And Lucy Powery. Can you hear me, Lucy? Lucy, Lucy. I write for teenagers. I've written yeah. a paper. Oh, sorry, we had a bit of a yeah. lag, Lucy. Off you go. Uh, sorry, <laughs> my name is Lucy Powery. I wrote for teenagers. I wrote the Paper and Heart Society series. And in the first book, they go on a road trip around the UK. And one of the locations is the Bronte Parsonage. And I've also uh, been the Bronte Society's young ambassador um, and hosted a Bronte book club for Emily's centenary year on YouTube. I've done lots of other um, activities to engage young people um, in reading and learning about the Brontes. And Sarah Shoemaker. Unmute yourself. You're muted Sarah. This is like it's a it's a classic bit of zoom um, yeah. video isn't it? Hey we've got her. <laughs> 
Okay, I am Sarah Shoemaker. I'm the author of three contemporary novels and um, most recently, um, Mr. Rochester. Um, this is the American uh, the version and this is the British. Oh, I love that cover. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> I'll hold it better for you to see. Mm. Anyway, um, I got the idea for writing uh, about Mr. Rochester uh, from a book group that I'm in. Uh, so many of the women couldn't quite get where he was coming from or how we were to understand him. And so I thought somebody should write his story. And as Toni Morrison said, if there is a book you would really like to read and it's not been written, then you must write it yourself. So that's what I did. Strong agree, strong <laughs> agree. So that's all of our panel um, and I'm very pleased to introduce them to you today. We're gonna um, kick off with, I suppose, an enduring question, it's not really a question, but a reason. And the reason that we're all here today, the reason that we're all behind the brilliant Bronte 2020 conference, which is why, why the Brontes? Why do they capture our imaginations? Um, so much and continue to do so throughout time. I, I for speaking for myself, I first came across them when I was a 10-year-old child um, and I, my mum dragged me to the parsonage on a visit and I was really, I didn't want to go. Um, but the minute that I walked in, I was absolutely captivated and I think I saw, even then at, that, at the age of 10, I saw, saw people that I could relate to because they were more like me than other authors. They, they weren't wealthy, they weren't posh, um, they weren't particularly accepted into societal norms and yet they were incredibly creative and, and inspirational and from that moment on, I loved them before, in fact, I read my first Bronte novel, which was Jane Eyre. But what about everybody else? Lucy, who is, who was the, um, you said she was the youth advocate for the parsonage, completely forgotten the word. Um, <laughs> but Lucy, what about you? What in the, your sort of 21st century Bronte fan, what was it that did it for you? So I think it would be incredibly difficult to pinpoint one thing, I think, with the Brontes it's all about that kind of journey into the Brontes so I started by reading Agnes Grey which is timely for Anne's bicentenary year this year um, and I loved it so much and then I was going through a bit of a bad time in Red Wuthering Heights and I was I loved how dark it was you know you read books and you might want you escape into them but it was so dark that I felt like it kind of explained some of those feelings that I was going through um, and the more that I read of them the more I feel like their books are about identity and about who we are as people what we believe in what we're passionate about um, because they as people were extremely passionate about writing about the world that they were writing about and I think that that for me is why I've continued to love them so much. It's not just about their books anymore. It's gone further than that into their lives and what their lives can teach us and how we can live by some of the ideals that they live behind. For example, I always think of Emily saying, I wish to be as God made me. And I try to live by that. I try to live true to myself. And that's something I've taken away from the Brontes. Yeah, I think that they are, are actually real flag bearers for sort of the artistic outsider. And as authors and, and poets and artists, that, sort of, that kind of resonates with all of us at a very young age. Um, Sarah, what about you? What's it, what is it for you about the Brontes? Well, uh, for one thing, um, even today, women are not totally equal to men in many societies, including our own. And I think that issue really binds us to the Brontes. I see that particularly in Jane Eyre, um, and also the difference between uh, various social standings positions. Uh, one of my favorite scenes in Jane Eyre is when Edward asks her, do you think me handsome? And um, as, as an inferior, supposedly, um, she's supposed to say something polite, I presume. Um, instead, she says, no, sir. And I, that, that really catches me every time I read that scene, because they're both 
opening themselves up to each other. And um, as far as the Brontes in general, I think we see those characters as themselves, as Julie already said, so closely and, and so admirably expressed. Yeah, 100% agree with you. Um, Julie Cohen. Do you know what? I think I've told you this before, Rowan, but I first encountered the Brontes um, by reading Wuthering Heights and I hated it. <laughs> I was a teenager and I absolutely despised that book. I had to read it for school and I, I really wanted to stab it. Um, and um, <laughs> it, <laughs> Say, oh my god, who are these people? And it was only um, all right, I'm just gonna evict Julie from the conference now. No, no, there's a but, there's a but. So, so it was only um, through getting a little bit more mature and understanding my response a little bit more to understand that my visceral response to that novel was really why I think it is such a great novel because it is so out of step with all of the societal norms that you expect in a novel like that. And it is so disruptive and transgressive that when I was a teenager, I was very disturbed by it. But as an adult, I find it incredibly exciting. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's so invigorating. And um, I think it really reflects Emily. And that's, I think, that's why she's so fascinating to us because she is so transgressive and so original and and, and refuses to be put in a box, even now, 200 years after her birth and more. Um, Lyra, what about you? S sorry, Siri. Ugh. I've been you reading know, dark materials. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the reason we're fascinated by the Brontes is, is this almost mythical story of all the hardships they endured. And they lived in this remote village with not a single connection to the literature world. And somehow they, writing in secret, managed to write these masterpieces that are about the most intense human experiences and and we admire that but i think even more than that as 21st century women i think we love them because they were all early feminists as you were saying sarah their novels are powered don't you think by their rage against the patriarchal society of the time they they yearned to tell stories to live free in the world as men did but they couldn't because they were held back because they were women forced to take jobs as governesses and teachers and keep their father's house and write in secret and do whatever they could not to upset their brother so that he wouldn't feel that, you know, they were smarter than he was. And they even had to publish with male pen names because people would judge them and, and they couldn't, you know, admit that they were women. So it's not that much different in so many ways for us today. We're still struggling. But the one thing I wanted to add is, think about the heroines in their novels. Why do we love them? We have Jane Eyre. She's biting and kicking because, she, and she wants something that they won't let her have. They say, sit still, be quiet, be a good girl. And the adult Jane has all these soliloquies about the rights of women who are subjugated by men that are still relevant today. And in Wuthering Heights, Catherine Earnshaw is only her true self on the moors with Heathcliff. But what does she do? She dresses up and puts on an act so she can get married because that's the only way to survive. And, and Anne, she let out her rage in Agnes Grey for all the indignities she suffered as a governess, just as Charlotte did with Jane Eyre. And in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which I just love, it's really about the main character, Helen, finally slamming the door against her drunken husband. And this is what we admire about these women we understand them and i think the brontes books are the gift that just keeps giving i agree with you and they really resonate in the present day and i guess that's why we're all here because uh books like the tenant of wildfire hall still are so relevant about abusive relationships and about addiction um Fanula. Yeah, um, so I think a lot of what people have said so far really resonates. I also started reading the Brontes novels young. Jane Eyre was my first one. It was read to me and then by me. Um, the first Bronte biography I ever read was The Dark Quartet, which introduced me to the life story, which I think is part of what's so compelling, not just what they wrote, but how they lived and those hardships that they went through that were mentioned. And then I did a master's in 19th century literature. So I was very much embedded in this period. But for me, what inspired me to write Bronte's Mistress and take a very different angle on them 
was actually reading the Elizabeth Gaskell biography. So the first Bronte biography and coming across her depiction of Lydia Robinson, who was Branwell's affair partner. And he, and she calls her this profligate wretched woman, says she tempted Branwell into the deep disgrace of a deadly crime. And I just found the depiction dripping in internalized misogyny and blaming women for sexual transgression more than man, and certainly more than Branwell, she says, in this case, the man became the victim. So she really removes any blame from this man. And yeah, there is certainly many debates to be had about the Gaskell biography, and I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure that there are, are many debates have been had, and we'd love to get into that even more in um, perhaps in Slack afterwards, because it, it's quite a thing. Um, wow. What I think is really interesting, uh, Sarah, is that, wait, Nikita, sorry. Who, hands up who I haven't talked to yet, because I've lost track. <laughs> Nikita. Um, what I think is really interesting, Nikita, is that we are still revisiting these stories that are now uh, 150 years old, and we are still finding something as 21st century women um, from around the world, from different cultural backgrounds, we're still finding elements of uh, discovery about ourselves and about our condition and about what our aspirations in these novels um, and what I'm interested in is how we can interpret those values those ideas that activism into poetry for example so I find a lot of similarities between the Brontes and Emily Dickinson right women writing at the same time, uh, women having to navigate the patriarchy. Uh, Emily Dickinson, despite being extremely prolific as a poet and having written thousands of poems, found it very hard to be published and finally was published under a male pseudonym, which is very much like the Barantes. And I think what really transcended for me is that what the patriarchal society back then was, uh, you still have a lot of that in India. You can't go out without a male escort. There is still so much pressure put on women not to upset the men, even with their success. And I found that I really connected with the Brontes on that, how much they kind of had to hide how intelligent and clever they was to, to, make, to make sure that their brother didn't get upset and feel low. And I see that, I used to see that a lot growing up um, among the women in my family, but also the women that I knew is that they would have to downplay their own successes to make sure that men wouldn't get upset. And we're still replaying those ideas because the role of the patriarchy is that you erase the work of women constantly, but the Brontes have endured that. And I think that is so exceptional. And it's what I saw in Jane Eyre, that despite being what is, you know, a plain girl, a poor girl, she stood up for herself in a way that I, you know, it, it, as a 14 year old girl reading the book for the first time, it was so inspiring to me. Um, so it does transcend, their work transcends culture and it transcends years and it transcends time. Because if a little brown girl growing up in New Delhi could look at, you know, Jane Eyre and go, wow, I want to be like her. That means their work is just universal and that's their appeal. That's their beauty. Yeah, and I guess, I, I guess that's, perhaps why as authors we are so drawn to looking at their lives, looking at their novels and reinterpreting them and exploring them um, and bringing them again to a new audience and to fresh eyes um, as all of us are doing in one way or another. Um, because it is that, it's that mercurial magic, isn't it? That you just, it's like catching lightning in a bottle. And I think the fact that they, broke out of their very sort of lower middle class, quite poverty stricken background and weren't afraid to read everything that they could get their hands on and write letters to the poets, the newspapers of the day to try and get recognition, to try and get guidance. Um, and that they really just, particularly Charlotte, refused to give up until she had broken that glass ceiling for want of a better expression. Um, so that leads us nicely into um, our next topic, which is that all of us have um, written, either we've written directly about the Brontes and their lives in a fictional form, or we have uh, taken inspiration from their novels. And in the case of The Vanished Bride, 
bit of both. And, um, and it's kind of actually takes a lot of courage, I think, to be brave enough to write a fictional um, retelling of the lives and stories uh, of people that you love, but that you know so many other people love. And they are so important to so many people. Um, so what I would like to know now is how when we were when you were approaching when you had that idea for a fictional Bronte novel and you were approaching it how did you go about it and how did you get over the the kind of the fear because I know myself of the vanished bride as a quite playful idea uh the idea of Bronte sisters as amateur sleuths that I was I was absolutely terrified to write that book in the beginning um and then I thought and then I thought, no, because this is the book, I Sarah said, this is the book I want to read. And so I'm going to write it. And I made sure that I wrote it with all the love and reverence and uh, dedication to um, getting the biographical facts as accurate as I possibly could. And then filling in all the spaces with um, Emily doing some light breaking and entering in order to solve a mystery. Um, so Siri, how about you? How did you approach that? Well, like you, I was very reverential in my feelings about sticking to the facts. And when I wrote The Secret Diaries of Charlotte Bronte, I, I was determined to do honor to Charlotte and her family and tell the true story. Um, and um, I'll, I'll explain how I managed to fit in the fiction and weave it in as well. But the true story is so incredible. We have so much information about them from Charlotte's Preserved Letters, from all the biographies, starting with Mrs. Gaskell's, and she did a lot of research about that, and also in um, her novels. Now, you look at Charlotte's novels, and every one of them is autobiographical to a huge degree. I was fascinated and thrilled by this, and I did an entire talk on it at um, Chotten House Library a while back, and I'll just give a tiny smidgen of some of the things that I learned because I find them so intriguing. You start with Lowood School, where Jane Eyre suffered so much. Well, that was based 100% on clergy daughter school, where Charlotte and her sisters went, and where Charlotte lost two of her elder sisters, Mariah and Elizabeth. And she not only based the entire school on everything she suffered, but she also had one of her main characters, Helen, die based on, inspired by her sister. And she created Jane Eyre in her own likeness as a small, plain woman dressed in Quaker garb who served as a governess like Jane did, or like Charlotte did, and who drew and sketched with passion, just like the Bronte sisters. And I love the fact that Mr. Rochester is inspired not only by a character from Charlotte's childhood writings, the Duke of Zamorna, but also on her married professor from Belgium, Monsieur Hergé, who smoked cigars and in every way was just like Rochester and with whom she fell in love. And Charlotte knew it was a sin to fall in love with a married man. So what did she do? She gave that exact same sin to Jane Eyre. And Charlotte's father went blind, so Rochester goes blind, spoiler. Uh, Branwell <laughs> set fire to the drapes of his bed in a drunken stupor, so she put that in her book. She even has the last third of the novel with Jane living in a quiet, remote village with, in a social setting with sisters. It's exactly a mirror of Charlotte's own life at the Parsonage. And then, this is my favorite thing, Charlotte once visited North Lees Hall, which is very much like Thornfield Hall in description, where she learned that the first mistress was in stain, confined to a padded room in the attic, and later died in a fire that destroyed a large part of the building. So there's also all kinds of characters and incidents and events that she put into her book Shirley and Viette, which we don't have time to go into now, but all of these things were autobiographical. So I was able to weave them into my novel, but as they happened to Charlotte. So not only did I have the wonderful facts of her life to draw upon, which made a great story. But then, of course, I had the fun of fictionalizing all kinds of things because we weren't really there. So 
the author's yeah, job is to bring bit, it to life. It's a little bit like um, reverse engineering their stories, isn't it? And I've, I must say I've had a lot of fun with that with uh, Vanished Bride, with sort of figuring reverse engineering what may have been inspiration, what definitely was inspiration, what we know from the biographical facts. And I'm sure that everybody at the conference is, um, has read all of the biographies. Um, and I think what I love to do particularly is to find a little tiny incidental fact. And from that, you can spin out a whole novel, if you're lucky. Um, Fanula, I love your idea of focusing on Mrs. Robinson um, and that you're inspired by the Gaskell novel. But how did you approach that? Because Mrs. Robinson is often the baddie in the sort of Bronte narrative. She's the villainess. So similarly to what you're saying, Rowan, and Siri as well, I did a lot of research on the known facts with the Bronte's biographies, but also Lydia Robinson's biography, and was very referential that way. None of us know what happened at Fort Green Hall, but I wanted my book to be what could have happened with what we do know. But where I think you could say I was less referential or a little bit more um, provocative was that I agree that the Brontes, I love their novels, I think they're feminists, but they were still of their time and they still had blind spots. And especially with Charlotte, I had this feeling that her heroines were often kind of poor, plain, young and virginal. And I wanted to write about a woman who was beautiful, wealthy, older, sexually experienced. She's had five kids, she's 43 at the start of my novel and say, well, life's not great for her either. And my Lydia Robinson is no angel. She's absolutely a white feminist who only sees her own privilege. She doesn't see her own privilege and only sees her, how she's a victim. She doesn't care about her servants. She references um, slavery just to make a good impression at a dinner party by saying that she's pro the abolition movement. Um, but I didn't wanna make an ideal feminist. I think in some ways, the Brontes have been held up as that because they're plain, because they didn't have children, because only Charlotte married and then tragically died young. And I'm interested in saying, that you don't have to be an ideal feminist. And I wanna tell the stories of all those women who were not the exception, were, didn't have the bravery of the Brontes or the imagination to see that we're, a world could be a different way. Um, and yeah, I'd love to kind of hear if there are any other thoughts from anyone else. I know, Nikita, you do a lot of work around feminism as well. And uh, I guess this is where I've been worried that I'm going, to, going up against the Brontes in some ways, even while I love their novels and all of their writings. Um, I, I'm uh, basically a childless woman and I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to have kids. Um, and this is by choice. And till date, I've noticed that there are people who will tell me I will change my mind. And this is like, I'm trying not to generalize here, but I know a lot of women who have the same conversation again and again going, I, I don't want children. And the fact that the Brontes as people chose not to, you know, they never, they didn't have children. They had, they themselves were feminists. I wouldn't call them perfect feminists because there's no such thing. We are all bad feminists in our own way. We all do the wrong thing. I think, uh, I haven't read your book, but it sounds absolutely fascinating. I, I love the idea I love villainesses. I love the idea of, of you know, uh, someone not seeing their privilege, someone being unlikable and that person leading a story because I think that's far, far more believable. That's far more interesting. So I, um, I completely agree with you. I think we should challenge like this idea of perfect feminists anyway. Um, there's no such thing. And isn't it fascinating how even as uh, even as kind of strong heroines that were in the Bronte novels that they they don't are not adverse to a bad woman to be mm. you know at the root of all the evil in, at the end and that's and of course they wouldn't have even understood the term feminism what they were doing wasn't feminism to them it was literally just standing up for what they believed was right for themselves and for others and a kind of equality. Um, which they were all working towards, particularly Anne, I think. Sarah, you um, created, you've gone into the story of Mr. Rochester, who's such an interesting character. And how, how did you approach that? Did you approach that wanting to make him a romantic hero or something different? Well, when I first read and, and previous times read, uh, subsequent times read, um, Jane Eyre, I always saw him as a romantic hero. But then when I got the idea to write the book, and I thought 
that it would not be that hard because I would just tell the same story through someone else's eyes. But of course, I couldn't do that because we need to know his background. And so really about two thirds of the book uh, is before he even meets Jane and builds up what kind of man he is. And I read uh, Jane Eyre <laughs> several times again, uh, looking for what Charlotte was trying to tell me uh, about, about Mr. Rochester. And I, I know there are a lot of people who think that he is uh, anti-hero um, and I can't buy that because uh, A, we are supposed to, uh, Charlene intends us to admire Jane Eyre, to think that Jane is intelligent and independent. And I think she doesn't intend for us to think that Jane would fall in love with a man who's not worthy of her. So I had to look for this worthiness and see what she would see uh, in him as worthy. And uh, so that was sort of my guidepost. What, what is Charlotte really trying to tell us about Jane's feelings toward Mr. Rochester? Uh, and part of the way he acts so um, meanly or dishonorably, I believe has to do with what I referred to before as the difference in their social positions. He was not in a position where he could um, romance her openly because that just wasn't done. When, when men romanced the governess of the family, it was only for one thing and that was not what he had in mind. Um, so he had really to bring her to him, to force her to make, to make the commitment uh, to him, which he does in all kinds of ways, I believe. Um, some more helpful than others, I think, or maybe some wiser than others, because he's not a perfect person, but he, he was trying to get her to commit herself to him. And finally, and an, I, I already quoted one scene, and, and, and another scene that is one of my favorites, because it's the one that forces her to finally open up to him, is, is when he tells her that, um, He's going to be married soon and he's going to have to find a new position for her. And uh, so he says that he has uh, made inquiries to a woman uh, who, uh, looking for someone, see, see if he can find a woman who has children that Jane could be the governess of. And uh, so he finds a woman um, who has five daughters and her, her name is Miss. Mrs. Dionysius Ogal, and she lives in Bitternut Lodge in uh, Connaught, Ireland. And you read that and you just laugh out loud. You think, how ridiculous is this? You know, and, but Jane buys it and it just makes her angry and makes her finally, finally express herself and express how she feels about him. And that's, that's really, to me, one of the best parts of that novel is, is when after all the things he's tried, finally this little silly uh, idea is what brings her to, to say what she feels because in her position, she really shouldn't be doing this. She shouldn't be telling her boss that um, the master of the house, that she loves him. Uh, no more than he should be telling the governor's, governess that he loves her, but I just, I just love that. I love that interpretation. I've never thought about it um, from that perspective before. It's really interesting to think that he's goading her into confessing her love for him. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's fascinating, Sarah. So, Lucy, when you're when you're writing, I know you're not fictionalizing for. Um, straight in a straightforward way but you are trying to bring these books to uh the young generation and away audience how do you approach that well i think for me fundamentally 
I believe in the power of books and the power of these stories and I think that they can teach so much to so many people so that's that's really what I'm trying to get at with my books is to if I inspire one reader to go away and read one of these books after they've read my book then I feel like I've done my job right but I also think what kind of ties all of us together and what will tie everybody together who is watching this is that really I like to think that the Brontes are formed in our own image. So there are a finite, a finite number of versions of the Brontes and each one of us has a different idea of what they were like and what they were about. And I think putting that into words, putting it on the page into a book, brings that version to life in a different way and inspires other people to view the Brontes differently. Um, and I was, I, I think that the Brontes are the main characters in their own stories. And so like Fanula was saying, she's telling that story with a different main character. And I think again, it's about seeing them as people with flaws, with positive points with things that we love but also things that we can acknowledge they weren't perfect they were of their time but so are we right now i think they agree with you 100 percent um so julie in your novel you have um brought a whole a different perspective to slightly later victorian fiction and how do you approach writing about um, sexuality and about a, a lesbian romance in a Victorian setting? Well, um, it was super fun um, and challenging. Um, one of the things that really struck me about what Lucy just said was that um, we look to the Brontes and we look to literature to understand ourselves. And I think that we, we read to understand what we're reading about, but we also read to understand what's deep in here. And, and that sort of Is comes... That Sorry, have I gone? Am I still there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, can... great. Um, so, so we read to find out, you know, what's, what's going on in our own heads as well as what's going on in the page. And um, my characters do that too. So it was really important to me when I was writing a Victorian story to have my characters reading contemporary novels. Um, and the Bronte novel that I, that I took was um, Villette, because I think that Lucy Snow, who's, who's hiding so many aspects of herself and who feels like such an outsider, um, is a good analog for, for queerness and for feeling that you don't fit in with your society and having a whole secret life inside you. So I was choosing the novels that I referenced very carefully, um, but that one really struck me as, as being a wonderful study of, of how it feels not to belong and to have a truth inside you that you can't share with other people. I wanted to add one little thing after hearing all of your wonderful insights into your books that um, one thing that inspired me like Fanula wanted to write about Mrs. Robinson. I wanted to write about Arthur Bell Nichols because this was the man who really ended up changing Charlotte's life and their relationship is what fascinated me because it extended over many years. But when you read Juliet Barker's biography, he doesn't show up until like a page a thousand. He's like sprinkled in here and there, but they knew each other all this time. So that was the fun I had in conjecturing what was that relationship like over that entire period of time and how did it go from Charlotte hating him to falling madly in love with him after she married him. I think that's one of the things that's really, for fiction, for novelists, that's really interesting about the Brontes is that we feel like we know a lot about them um, because we have all the wonderful letters that Ellen didn't burn, bless her, and we have all the wonderful things, you know, we have all the artifacts, we have their house. But actually, we, I think we know perhaps about 5% of, of their entire lives is recorded. So that leaves so much room for fiction and so much room for imagination, which brings us on to the last, um, sort of phase of our topics today, which is how would they, what would they think of us today? What would Charlotte think of um, Charlotte sitting over, I've got a little bust over there, Charlotte watches me write every day and I'm pretty sure, um, you know, if I feel like she would disapprove, I feel like I can 
feel her staring into the back of my head. Um, but more than that, I think it's really important for all of us who are invested in Bronte sisters and the Bronte family and their lives and their work to carry on that amazing tradition that they began of activism, of standing up for what you believe in and um, making your voice heard, even if you are a small, plain woman from, uh, you know, an inconsequential background, that you can still make your voice heard. So what I'm interested in is how do we go forward in the 21st century Ampl amplifying the voices of Charlotte, Emily and Anne and making sure that they reach, they continue to reach audiences, wider audiences and continue to resonate um, through the ages. And how do we build on that legacy? Um, Fanula. Yeah. Um, I think the easy answer for me on what would they think of this is to talk about Lydia Robinson. I think that's a whole can of worms <laughs> not to go down. <laughs> Um, but on the other side, one thing that really strikes me is how public being a writer is today. Um, so the fact that we're all here connecting with you on Zoom, I think, is the future. And it is the way we reach more people who can't, aren't in the UK, who can't visit the parsonage. And technology is going to be a wonderful conduit to that. But it also forces writers to be much more front and center. And the Brontes, of course, were partly forced into using their pseudonyms because of the patriarchal society in which they lived. But in some ways, Emily especially really liked the protection. Whereas now as a writer, you're very much a brand, you're on display. And I know more so for other panelists than me, social media is so huge to what you're doing, Nikita or Lucy. And I think there's a lot of good that can come from that, but I also think it comes with its own challenges. So as women writers were asked very uncomfortable questions, I've been asked, are the sex scenes in, your, in my novel based on my experiences? <laughs> I answer, of course not, like I'd never had sex with Branwell Bronte. But I think that women writers are really kind of grilled about their own biographies. Um, and so the good is we'll move forward with technology, we'll reach more people, we'll get the Brontes everywhere, not just the people lucky enough to be in New Yorkshire. Um, but the flip side of that is the very public nature of writing. And part of why the Brontes produce such wonderful work, I think, is the isolation and their protection that they had in some ways from the other world. I think so often of Anne's uh, last letter where she says that she just, she, she wishes God would make her well because she has so much to do. Um, she has so many plans and she just wants a little more time. And I think about Anne, in in the terms that she really was a she was just at the beginning of what she could do and the potential that she had to really make a change in the world and i think all of them have had that potential but perhaps and more than most and i wonder how we can best build on that legacy so rather than looking back at the history of the brontes to sort of push forward um, for Anne. What would you say about that, Lucy? Well, I think this is, again, a, a really big, complex question that doesn't have yeah, yeah, a sorry. single answer to it. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, for me, it's all about engaging the next generation into reading the Brontes to finding things that they can engage with and can feel passionate about in the Brontes works, no matter what that is. And I um, was thinking about what Julie said earlier about not liking Wuthering Heights when she read it for the first time. And for me, my message is that for any young person who might watch my YouTube videos that I create, many of which are about the Brontes, that it's okay not to like these books it's all about feeling passionate about something. So you can love it, you can hate it, that's okay too. Um, and so I suppose what I'm trying to do is to use social media like YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, to engage that next generation of readers and to make them feel like, yeah, I can read this. It doesn't have to be complicated. I don't have to understand everything. It's just about developing those thoughts. It's about feeling something about the words on that page and and I think that's how you engage that next generation. I think that's brilliant and it's brilliant to be an advocate for independent thought and 
I think that's what encapsulates um, the, the sisters so much is that they were they they were their own people. They they developed critical and independent thought, kind of against the odds. Um, Nikita, what would you? How do you build on that legacy of uh, of feminist literature going forward? Um, I think one of the main things which I when I first started writing, I was 100% sure of, was I am writing for women. That's who I write for. That is my audience. All of my work is for women. And I found a lot of pushback still that people didn't like that I wasn't writing for everyone, that I was specifically writing for women. Um, and I specifically write for marginalized women. I, I write as a second language English speaker, as a person who writes in her second language, uh, using social media was wonderful to me because it, it, I found that I didn't have to contain my writing to a particular set of rules that were invented by somebody else so that I could write a very specific type of poetry. And I was able to write what I wanted. And funnily enough, lots of people, my, my biggest audience happens to be young women between the ages of 14 to about 25 who really love the work. And because of the, the poetry that I put out there and I constantly talk about other poets, um, they are reading, like say, Emily Dickinson, they are reading, you know, Charlotte Bronte. They are, it's, it's all about being able to engage the, the next generation. And I think the Bronte sisters, because they transcend so easily and I was able to kind of find myself in their work as a brown girl, I think that they have the capacity to reach generations after we're gone. You know, and I think that's what's so powerful. All the all the characters were so amazing, like White Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys. I love that because I hadn't even thought about the mad woman upstairs. And then there's a whole book about her and it's yeah. it's amazing. So yeah. Um, and, and, and I just, I love the idea of using social media uh, to sort of break out of that, of that canon almost and that, and the, and the sort of idea of what is real writing and what is, and what is proper. I mean, I know that a few years ago now that somebody said, asked me what books that I, kind of books that I write. And I said, I write for women. And they said, well, have you ever thought of writing a proper book? Um, at which point I stabbed them in the eye with a fork <laughs> in my head, in my head. But um, the the idea that you can harness social media to empower and and to to bring to bring forward our, our self self conscious and our feelings and our, about equality and how we think about ourselves and how we think about equality and how we think about what we can achieve as individuals is very Bronte, I think. Exactly. Um, we've got a, a couple more minutes before we go to questions. So. Um, Siri, uh, yeah, Siri, how do you think you would, um, we, you can build on the legacy of, Bron of the Brontes in Austin, uh, who I know you, obviously you're also an expert on? Well, I think to honor these writers who we love, we should be telling the stories that we are passionate about. Like you said, Rowan, write a book that you want to read and write the theme that you want to read about. I think um, as writers, we have this power to share something very special. And we should um, think about what it is we're trying to say with our books. Uh, make sure our characters learn and grow and change over the course of the novel in a meaningful way that reflects the thing that we want to express. So whether or not it's a murder mystery or a romance or a, any other kind of story, as long as the main character comes away from it, um, an empowered woman who has changed and grown from her experience, I think that is what the kind of stories we need to be telling, the kind of stories people love to read. And that will really honor the Bronte's legacy because that's what they did. They wrote what they were passionate about and what was real. And they brought it oh, to yeah, life. Yeah. And I love that idea, don't you, that we are a band of women authors writing for women, um, primarily for women, and um, and bringing our readers forward. Each each page with us is a, is another step forward, and also another way. I hope to broaden horizons and boost uh, expectation, and. Uh, gift aspiration, and I think all of all of us are doing that. Um, Sarah, is there anything you want to add before we go to questions about the sort of 
21st century Bronte legacy? Well, let me start out by, by saying that because I'm probably the old, almost certainly the oldest person on this panel, um, I've had the experience of having to uh, disguise my um, sex in um, by, I was asked to write uh, under initials so that because I wrote a book that, well, my first three books were uh, international thriller type books and the third one in particular was considered especially attract uh, the hope was to attract men to read it and at that time particularly not so much now um, men wouldn't read books written by women and uh, so I had to deal with that issue um, interestingly actually um, I met uh, one time met a gentleman who wrote romances under a woman's name. So uh, actually it goes both ways, but I think these days it's not so important the gender of the person who writes the books. I just want to say that because I feel connected to the Brontes who felt that they had to make their gender hidden. Um, as far as the rest is concerned, yes, we, we have much more um, wide ranging ability to, to change what people think uh, to be out there in the public and to let let people know that writers are uh, in the first place real people and in the second place people that um, are doing really important work and one of the things that was said earlier and I, I want to reiterate it is that we read because we help that helps us understand ourselves and I think that's the key to the Brontes writing is that we read them and we always find something that tells something about ourselves and that's that's one of the big values of reading fiction i think absolutely and i think that's a per the perfect point to go to questions so um i think as i understand it claire that it's uh if you if you want to ask us a question you can unmute yourself um and ask us via video or if you're feeling a bit shy, ask in the chat. Yeah, and we were going to suggest, because there's so many of us, if you could direct who your question is to, that would be really helpful, because we're not going to be able to have all seven of us answer every oh, question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good. Well remembered. <laughs> uh, so who's anybody, who's going to be the brave? So I have a question that is, um, to, is a general question, I think, from our MIT. Uh, I'm Ritz, I apologize, I'm Ritz. Uh, are there still publishing purchases that apply to female authors when publishing today? Um, so I'm going to throw that to my friend Julie Cohen because I know she has quite a lot to say on that subject. <laughs> yes, yes, I believe that uh, the publishing industry is in no way unbiased um, when it comes to gender, when it comes to race, when it comes to sexuality. I think that um, publishing has a lot of gatekeeping still um, in place and that has a lot and, and publishing and writers have a lot to dismantle in there. So yes, is the easy and big answer to that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that's perhaps why it's, it's so great that Nikita, you, you're doing what you're doing without that gatekeeping stopping you. In fact, now yeah. the gatekeepers will want you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was interesting um, to find that a lot of publishers were now, you know, approached me after I managed to build the platforms for myself. But still, we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, we, we recently published a diversity report that came out and it is very clear that the publishing industry is very biased, especially when it comes to race. We don't know how to pitch books uh, around brown and black people. Uh, we don't believe that like there's literally so many editors have told me in the past that actually brown and black people don't read like this is actually something that I was told as a brown woman. So and this is recent, right? I've been told like, oh, we don't have enough room for another brown author on our list because we already have a brown author. So we have a lot of biases that we have to work through. Um, and to be like a queer brown woman writing, that is 
in itself, that existence in itself sometimes feels like rebellion against the patriarchy. Um, and it's good to have a platform and to be able to talk about these things quite widely and quite publicly, which I don't shy away from, even if it gets me into trouble. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't shy away from it. And I think really importantly, none of us should shy away from it because we all need to voice this. We all need to be allies. We all need to make sure that we're doing what Anne Bronte would have done, which is strive for a better situation for all of us. Um, yeah. So thank you, Nikita, for doing that work. It's brilliant, and we're all behind you. Yeah. Um, Nick, so sorry, I have challenges of reader is think about are you reading diverse voices and diverse stories and diverse authors, um, and also when you are reviewing books, are you holding, say, women characters to a higher standard of likability than male, or bring your own bias into how you're interpreting characters? I think it's great for us to think about as readers too. Yeah, that's a really important point, Fanula. Um, I have a, a question from Alison Raper um, for me. Thanks, Alison. What inspired you to imagine the Bronte sisters as detectives? Um, and the answer is that I was writing um, my latest Rowan Coleman novel, The Girl at the Window, which is set in Pondon Hall, which is um, which was known to the Bronte sisters and also part of the inspiration behind Wuthering Heights. And um, there was a, there's a storyline in it where there, the, the, there's a missing, potentially a missing second Emily Bronte novel. And I thought, um, and because of this mystery, I thought it would be fun if there was a sort of cameo of the sisters interwoven into this book, which already covered three timelines. Um, solving a mystery between them but as soon as I had that idea I thought wait a minute that's too much fun just to be part of a book um, and, and thus the Bronte Mysteries was born and I was absolutely delighted that nobody else had done it first because I couldn't believe it um, so I'm very very happy about that um, so uh, next question is from Nava which I think is really interesting she says what you do isn't exactly fan fiction, so what would you call this genre? Um, Siri, what would you say to that? <laughs> Historical fiction is, of course, the name that it's given to what we do. And I, I still, I like that because it's historical, it's inspired by or based on the true lives of these people, but it's also m mingled with fiction. And, you know, I like to use this analogy and you were doing the same thing Rowan. and I take when I wrote the lost memories of Jane Austen I took the known facts about Jane's life and then I imagined what if she fell in love with a man who inspired her to go back to writing and I interwove his story with hers and came up with a reason why she could never tell the world about it and so that's why I think historical fiction is still the best term and yes we have fans but for some reason fan fiction doesn't quite sound as respectable I mean, I'm, I'm fairly kind of on board with the fact that I write fan fiction because I am a fan. I'm a huge fan. I think everybody who knows me or follows me on social media knows that I'm reasonably obsessed uh, about that. And also, I think <laughs> that the, the Bronte sisters or the Bronte children kind of invented fan fiction, right? Um, you know, Gondor oh. and Angria and their little books. The, the, that is fan fiction. So I'm very proud to be uh, following in that tradition. Uh, anybody else got any thoughts on that? I think that the denigration of fan fiction is part of a pattern of putting down women's writing, whether it's romance or women's fiction or fan fiction, anything that women love is automatically seen as less than, whether it's reality TV or a rom-com is seen as lesser than a James Bond movie. Um, and I think it's ridiculous. Well said. Yes, I strongly agree with you. So uh, I think all our books fit into different genres, but, um, but we are all fans and we all write fiction. So um, <laughs> there's a question for Fanula from Gemma Greenhay. Uh, how difficult it was it to research Lydia Robinson? Uh, are there many sources of information about her, Fanula? Yeah, I won't go on and on about this because we don't have that much time, but I will in the Slack channel leave a link to a full hour long talk I did on this with the Historical Novel Society New York that's fully available. I've read every journal article ever published that I could find about Lydia Robinson in English. There's obviously biographies was a good first protocol. 
but I did a lot of research into the lives of everyone in the book, so the serpents as well, dived into census records, um, amazing diaries by a local carpenter called George Whitehead. Um, and then, of course, I did archival research at the Bronte Parsonage Museum as well. So I know there have been a lot of shout outs for that team today, but I'll add my voice to that chorus. Um, there's a whole section of papers there called the Robinson Papers, and that includes 18 letters by Lydia, um, as well as an amazing inventory of all the furniture in the house. So if I mentioned furniture, it was probably a piece of furniture that was there. My editor said, there's far too much mahogany. And I was able to reply, well, yes, I wasn't their interior designer. Um, but I'll leave a link <laughs> if any of you want to nerd out with me on the nitty gritty of the research. Um, I know not all historical novelists are as insane as I am about the research, but for instance, I know the date every scene in my novel is meant to take place. And I had to take out moonlight from one scene when I realized that there was no moon that night, it was a new moon. So I, I, was, I went deep on the research. I, that really is deep because I, I have put quite a lot of snow into the second Bronte Mysteries book and, and there was no snow. So sorry, everybody. Um, I'm now unmuting Patsy Stone, who's gonna ask us a question. Are you ready, Patsy? There you go. Um, yes. Um, I'm really sorry. I, I only joined this panel um, very recently because I was on the I was looking at the other one. Um, but I'm I, I'd like to ask your your you know extremely experienced panel, and I'd like to ask um, how you get Bronte fiction published. And this is not on my own account, but I've I've recently read this really wonderful. Um, a Bronte novel called A Marble Column, Jane Eyre in India, by Cicely Haverly, um, who is um, um, a very skillful writer indeed, who's done a huge amount of research. And I, I was, I, as some of you may know, I've read a great deal of uh, Bronte derivatives and sequels and even written a book about it. And um, in my opinion, this is a remarkable book, very, very unusual. But she first wrote to me about it four years ago and has been trying to get it published ever since and has failed despite, um, you know, um, eulogies from me and some other people and has finally published it herself independently through Amazon. And I just wondered, you know, are there any tricks or are there any particular publishers who are, are um, uh, more amenable to this kind of work? Um, I don't, I don't think that there are any particular tricks in other, in, in, but I do think that there is a problem with the gatekeepers, you know, and, and what, and publishing is, traditional publishing is incredibly cautious about what it will, uh, take on in the UK. I can't, I think, um, you know, the, our American colleagues can, could speak better for the US. So um, what I would say is that I, it's great that, you, that she has um, published independently and that if you can build sales independently and, and platform independently in the way that perhaps Nikita has, then you will get traditional publishers suddenly realizing that this is um, a, a story that people want to read. And the other thing I would say is that I hope that all of us on this panel are doing a bit to help um, that, you know, if our books are, are a success and that people really enjoy them and they take them up and they get a following, then they'll, that, that will again will give traditional publishers um, a reason to take it on. But I would say actually being traditionally published in, in these 21st century is by no means a be all and end all. Yeah, and definitely could, have could a I, very successful career. Could I add in, because um, I am uh, Vice President of the Romantic Novelists Association, and I would suggest, uh, Patsy, that, uh, that you recommend that your friends, that Cicely join a professional organization for writers as well, um, where she'll find a huge wealth of knowledge and contacts and networking opportunities, so um, that she should look up the Romantic Novelists Association if she's in the UK. Thank you very much. I was going to add it as well here that the Brontes themselves self-published with their poetry. Um, mm. So sometimes it just takes <laughs> the market time to catch up. So I know that's not very actionable advice, but I think there's some solace there. And knowing how minimal their sales were on that first book of poems that actually cost them money um, was something that was inspiring to me when I was in the query trenches or the, no, the first novel I got published was not the first novel I careered with. So rejection is hard and real and the Brontes themselves faced it too. 
Yeah, so much. And then Charlotte wrote Jane Eyre. So um, <laughs> that's my favorite story of creative resilience ever. And it's worth remembering that, you know, books like The Martian were self-published um, before they became a huge hit and dare I say it, 50 shades of grey. So um, there is room for to make a success out of this book and then to, uh, to, to show publishers that this is a story people want to read. And we, as everybody at this conference, can go find that book at, at, on Amazon and show publishers that we all want to read it because it sounds amazing and I definitely will do that. Um, let's see if Thank we have... <laughs> um, oh, it's a message from Claire Maycott to Nikita to just say keep rebelling Nikita I love your work so I think there's a question here about researching Mrs Robinson but I think you've answered that for Nula but we will all be in slack afterwards so if you want to go deeper into any of those subjects um, you can find us there just thinking um, it's the the time's run out um time's right, run out, right, yeah bye. i know this could go on Sorry. forever this is wonderful no don't apologize this has been a wonderful panel there are so many comments coming through and you guys have been amazing and you're all going to be taking questions on on slack yeah going right over to slack right now yeah so i don't know if everyone wants to unmute and thank uh everybody for participating and rowan who's done an absolutely wonderful job as chair super panel Ooh. everybody Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, I think we should all add a big thank you. I was going to say, but it's not on me. I was going to say we should all say a big thank you to you too, Claire, for doing everything uh -huh. and for putting this whole thing on. So thank you. Bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Claire. Pleasure. My pleasure. Right, we'll reconvene at 6.30, everybody. Have a good <laughs> break. Bye.